covered classic. I was surprised I hadn't been covered, so I figured I might as well cover the easy one. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, let me formally introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gaurav Mehra. I'm the managing director of uh, Saba Software. I run the Indian offices for Saba. I'm also one of the founders of that company uh, globally. And uh, I'm also president of SEEP. Just finishing up my term, Prashant here is vice president. So welcome to the SEEP Book Club together with the host of the event also. <laughs> um, you know, for the, some of you are here for the first time, so I'm very appreciative of your coming out. Uh, but basically, the book club is intended to be uh, a place where you know all of all the peers around the Pune industry can get together once a month, uh, pick a book of uh, you know, general interest, uh, and have somebody who's really passionate about the book and hopefully has tried to practice what it does, uh, talk about it and present the book. So it's not a book review; it's about what what you got out of the book. The audience we deliberately like to keep about this size because the whole point of this session is to have a lot of discussion. Uh, you know, in the in previous discussions we've taken sometimes two hours just to get through it because everybody has views, people have read the book, people have practiced it, people have questions, there's graded feeds, so it's been quite a bit of uh, interactivity. Um, and we try to keep it same old, uh, you know, same same channel, same place, same time, so it's reliably here every month thanks to Sangar, uh, who was originally put together by Ketan Manjara of Sangar, who was the uh, sort of driver behind getting it going. Um, and uh, you know, it, we've been running it now well over a year. So without further ado, let me uh, get started. And I wanted to, you know, I ended up uh, volunteering to do a book that I've liked for many years, but haven't read in a while. Uh, and so late last night, around 11.30, I started again. So, um, let me uh, quickly start with a quick uh, introduction for Jim Collins himself. Uh, you know, the book is, of course, right here. Jim, uh, Jim Collins, I had the chance to see him live in person in March. Uh, at our, you know, Sava's user conference uh, uh, was in March uh, in uh, uh, Miami this year, and Jim was invited as one of the keynote speakers. And I also had the opportunity to attend a small, more <coughs> private uh, fireside chat with him. I got to tell you, I, am the re I called up Sayyid and said, I'll do the book. Because he was fantastic. He was a fantastic speaker on stage. And, but what impressed me much more is in the fireside chat, they threw open questions at him. Right? The audience was, this was an audience of analysts actually, uh, typical you know, Wall Street and industry analysts. And they threw every kind of question at him for about an hour and a half. And, I, and every answer you know, was extremely thoughtful and gave you a new gem of information. So I was so utterly impressed with this gentleman that you know, I thought uh, you know, uh, I, I really wanted to go back and read the book again. I ended up reading his latest book, Great by Choice. Um, and I went back and uh, offered to do Good to Great. And so here we are. So that's the context again. Otherwise, you know, book club, she already had people lined up. Uh, Jim formally uh, likes to think of himself as a student uh, and inquisitive. And he talked about that a lot even in his personal session. You know, he talked about how curiosity is what has always driven him. Uh, and wanting to know how things really work. Uh, he was, he's been uh, on the faculty at the Stanford Business School for a long time, uh, won the Distinguished Teacher Award there, uh, and finally left to form his own, uh, works out of his own home in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where he basically looks at management research. Uh, you know, his wife, and you'll see references in the book, uh, herself uh, you know, has been in uh, teaching, uh, but gave that, gave that up to become a marathoner and, mm -hmm. and actually became the world champion in the Ironman competition in Hawaii, which for those of you who know the Ironman, is an enormously difficult uh, affair. Uh, substantial sea swim, then you do a huge bike ride, and then you run a whole marathon behind it. So uh, he himself apparently is uh, an avid climber. Uh, he, uh, you know, he had some references to that, and his bio basically has him talking about how he climbed uh, Half Dome. Uh, for those of you who've uh, been to that area in Yosemite, uh, it's this huge rock of a mountain, you know, it's like a big dome, and half of it just fell away. It's a sheer 3,000 cliff, uh, you know, so people go climbing, it typically takes two full days. People have to sleep hanging in little slings at night on the, on the rock, uh, rock face, and it's just absolutely straight up. It's quite a sight if you go see it, so he's done that uh, climb in a single day, actually, uh, so quite an achievement. So let me start uh, on the book. I've deliberately got very few slides, but uh, good to great is part of really a the second book in a four-book series, uh, where uh, 
Jim and uh, co-authors have taken sort of a look at what helps companies really become bigger. The first book was uh, Built to Last that looked at why companies survive longer. Why, you know, in a world where uh, within the first five years a huge percentage of companies die, where the Fortune 500 churns itself every 10 years or so, why is it that certain companies seem to survive for 100 years, 150 years? Uh, so Built to Last was a look at that. Good to Great basically was a study of how do companies that seem good, that seem like a lot of other companies at a certain point in their life, how do they suddenly jump to a level where they seem to have achieved greatness? Longevity, continuous returns, a substantially outperformance relative to the marketplace. Uh, and then they followed it up with how the mighty fall, a study of why companies that seem to be enormously successful then seem to come apart. Uh, and finally was the great by choice where they pulled a number of these threads together saying it's not about size of the company and sheer, you know, just the biggest companies in the world, but what are some key practices and behaviors that lets you uh, try to, you know, head yourself in the right direction. Um, so that's their most recent effort, very interesting reading. Um, and all of the books are, uh, you know, light reading in the sense they're not 300 pages of heavy duty management reading where, you know, the first content is up in the front. It's uh, it's deep research, told in an engaging style, anecdotes and uh, you know obviously personalities, case studies, interspersed throughout in a narrative. Uh, and that's been the style used and, and, and quite a bit. Um, so let me start with uh, Good to Great. You know, his opening line in the book is, good is the enemy of great. He says the reason we have, as he says in the, you know, uh, the reason we have uh, you know, the reason we don't have great schools is because we have good schools. They're good enough. They don't aspire to be more. And that's the issue. Often, I'm doing well and I'm doing good and I'm fine and I seem to be progressing well seems to be sufficient for a lot of people. And that's, to him, that's the key reason for not achieving greatness. It's until you get that drive to say, you know, good is just not good enough. It really seems to be a basis of that. Uh, behind that, uh, I won't get into the individual steps yet, it's easier to talk through them, but basically this in effect is the sort of big summary slide, very famous little picture now, uh, that it talks about what are the steps, what are the handful of ingredients that put together, relentlessly followed, with a you know, continuous discipline wrapped around it, tend to lead to companies re uh, achieving breakthrough results. No guarantees, but these seem to be what the ingredients they have. So more importantly, uh, in terms of a methodology that he's followed, you know, what he's tried to say is, you know, we want to do a study. There were, look, management books have been around forever. Everybody sort of talked about leadership and uh, this practice or that practice or what have you. What he tried to do is a uh, bottom-up, research-based analysis, rather than starting with a theory and proving it with, you know, with uh, data, the approach taken very deliberately was to do a comparative study. Find companies that have a very substantial track record. Um, you know, so find companies that, are in a, that have broken out at least 15 years earlier. And that existed 15 years before that as a minimum. So you have so much history that luck or one individual has not sufficiently played a role that makes all the difference. So you take those things out of the equation. And second, they have equated it to a to a, another company that is the same size. So they look deliberately for companies that have substantially outperformed the market and their peer group by factors of four or five or six or 10 consistently over a 15 year period that had a history of another 15 years before that, before they really broke out into that phase. And they've been compared deliberately against companies that look pretty much like them at the point they broke out to form a comparison, ideally in the same industry, pretty much in the same place, roughly same size, at least a similar history, if not, uh, uh, you know, exactly the same space, uh, exactly the same history. Um, so using that comparative, they found a bunch of uh, uh, outcomes, which he has then tried to say, okay, because this is what we observe, these are the conclusions we're drawing, rather than the other way saying, here's, you know, here's my pet theory of management, and I think this is why it, should, it ought to succeed. Uh, so that's really been the approach taken. Um, and I'll just jump right into starting with what they've observed. Uh, and I, you'll have to pardon me, I don't remember all the case studies. I'll pop into the book once in a while to sort of bring up the, uh, you know, the story here and there. I chose the slide background, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, 
you know, right here I quite enjoyed this quote because it's actually the exact opposite of what he's talking about. So Mark Cuban, for those of you who don't know, I can't remember the company, but one of the early internet companies made a killing, shows up on Dancing with Stars, Bigger Than Life, uh, and he's all over. And of course, you know, if, if you, you know, that's his quote. So not really humility there. Uh, when I die, I want to come back as myself. So, you know, you get the idea. Um, so, you know, traditionally when you've looked at companies being great, uh, as uh, Jim points out in his introduction, um, you know, you look at Jack Welch and Bigger Than Life Leaders. You look at Leah Iacocca and Bigger Than Life Leaders. You look at these guys like Mark Cuban out there, you know, larger than life, uh, talking about when I, when I die, I want to come back as me. Uh, and interestingly, they found that pretty much all of the great companies, all the companies that went from good to great at that transition point, almost invariably never had such a leader. None of them did. In fact, they had a huge negative correlation. Leaders like this blew the companies. They actually caused them to not stay in the game. In fact, destroyed very large companies. Um, and uh, so their conclusion really is what they're calling level five leaders. Level five leaders they define as leaders that are personally humble and have massive egos for their companies, massive ambitions for the company, not for themselves. In style, in substance, they always talk in terms of we and not I. They never talk about, you know, if they succeed, as he likes to say, uh, you ask them the cause of success, as he says, they look out of the window to apportion credit. You know, yeah, we got lucky, I had a great team, they helped make this happen, and when it's blamed, they look in the mirror. So they all seem to have that uh, attitude. Out of the 15 companies they looked at, you know, they basically pointed out 90% of them had exactly this kind of leader in place. Because the focus, it turns out, the goal of these leaders, as we said, is about ambition for the company. It's about building a great company. It's about building something beyond themselves. And they have all been relentless and ambitious in that regard, but never for themselves individually. You know, the story he tells is about Darwin Smith of Kimberly Clark. Farm town boy, puts himself, you know, works nights, puts himself through Indiana University, uh, works at Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark, of course, is paper and diapers and huggies and so on. Today, very well known. At the time they started, they, at the point of breakout, they were a traditional paper company, paper mills. They saw the wood, bring it down, turn it to pulp, produce paper. Business is okay, not going anywhere. Corresponding company, Scott Paper. Both about the same business, about the same time, about the same size. And the big event was Procter Gamble decided to come into the paper business and the consumer paper products business. Uh, Darwin Smith was elevated to CEO. He'd been inside the company for 18 years, company veteran. He was the in-house lawyer. He was the in-house lawyer, never been CEO. He wasn't sure he was qualified for the job. In fact, when they finally selected him, you know, one of the board members in the hallway pulled aside, I'm not, sure, not, I'm not quite sure you're qualified. <laughs> so at the end of 25 years at the helm, where he completely changed Kimberly Clark, delivered severe, serious outperformance. At his retirement, they asked him, you know, what drove you? He said, I never stopped trying to become qualified for the job. <laughs> so a question about what you said earlier. Sure. Uh, essentially, these guys are saying that people like Jack Welch, Leah Etuka, Mark Cuban are not good for a company like this. They cannot, they won't be. So let's talk about it more. Yeah. Let me throw you some more anecdotes from the book and I'll, then I'd love to discuss. So I like the first half of the book, so I'd love to spend <laughs> more time there. <laughs> the second is, uh, I don't have enough uh, uh, you know, opinion there to really go into the second bits. So, um, and I'll, I'll qualify some of the comments, right? Um, the, the key for these guys is really simple. As you said, ambition for the company. So number one, they worry about building a company. What's wrong with the big, bigger than life guys, right? One is personal ambition. They may go out and do a large acquisition. That's what happened to Scott Paper. Growth for growth's sake, growth because the guy wanted to do something. Big acquisition that didn't make sense through the company eventually. What did these guys do? This is a company that had existed for 50 years at the time he takes over. 
they've been, their whole start was from Kimberley in some state, I don't even remember, somewhere in the Midwest. Yeah? It's a little town called Kimberley, that's why it's Kimberley Clark. Basically in the paper mill and the paper business. He basically shut down all the mills. He shut down the core business of the company, completely cut with tradition, and moved the business over to consumer paper products to directly compete with this massive behemoth of PNG that had just entered his space. Scott Paper was sold a few years later. Uh, these guys, so it's not like he lacked ambition. He took some really hard decisions. As they say, do what must be done. He cut that old cord, changed mindsets, and drove the business into a completely new direction. And I'll talk about it wasn't an overnight thing, and then that's the whole point of this book, is that these things take time. Uh, but he had no problem doing what needed to be done. He thought off the traditional business, moved into a completely new area, completely focused on that and make it, made it happen. Yet, you ask him, how do you succeed? We had a lot of luck. Over 25 years, he had a lot of luck. And that's the point Jim makes. Whenever you talk to a bunch of these guys, you know, or you talk to people who knew these people,